All right, welcome back. We are game 2005 in the fall 2021 semester at George Brown. Uh, and it's week six, part one of our broadcast. But before we go and move on uh, to do this, let's make sure we copy our information for those people that need, uh, you know, kind of to to use YouTube as just another an additional means of um, of viewing this this material. A lot of times, people like to look at the this stuff asynchronously, or they need close captioning support. Uh, which is something that I want to be able to provide them as an alternate means of participating. So we've got our video like we normally have at every um, throughout every one of our uh, content weeks. Okay, let's move on. So again, today we're sitting at uh, October fourteenth, and we're talking about energy of a system. There's also a couple things to note for next week. We have our midterm test, and I know that some people have asked, you know, what's on the midterm test and how many questions and all those kind of things. Things that I can tell you that I'm going to share with you is this, right? You've got um, two attempts to do the midterm test, okay? So next week, you're going to get two attempts. There is a time limit to what you have, so there's not going to be a whole pile of questions. Again, right now, it's between 20 and 25 questions in that range um, that you're going to have to answer. And if you think about it, there's going to be some short questions that you can answer very, very quickly. And there are going to be some questions that are going to take you a lot longer to do. Um, so it works out to be about an hour is what I've, I've kind of put together. It may be slightly longer. I may adjust the time frames a little bit. I'm just going through the material one last time to make sure that they're good. What I've also done online for you is provide you with a cheat sheet. If you look up on week six, like I promised you from last week, there is a physics cheat sheet that covers most of the things that you need on your midterm. All right. So if you look at that document, it looks like this. All right. So it kind of, I've kind of put this together and to try and be as succinct as possible. Um, so again, anything about displacement over here, kinematics over here, uh, centripetal acceleration, all the, the formulas here, Newton's second law, kind of one thing to look at it, different kinds of motion for 2D motion. Uh, the three types of 2D motion and how this works. I've kind of put this together for you. Uniform circular motion and um, that we talked about before. So everything except for energy of a system. Okay. So that's the, the entire thing that we've talked about up until today. Okay. Now you may add to this, right? So you can take this cheat sheet in the real world if we were together, right? And if we were doing a live test, you get this cheat sheet ahead of time, a week ahead, like I'm giving it to you now. And then you'd fill it up with additional information, right, um, on the back end, the back, uh, the back side of the sheet. And you'd have kind of additional places to add some template questions. And that's what I recommend. Put some template questions somewhere, maybe in another sheet or two, that you can use, that you can refer to quickly, right? So you can, you can um, work as quickly as possible. One question I always get is, do I need to show my work? And... There might be some cases next week where I ask you to show your work or upload an image or something like that to, to support your, uh, your results, okay? That might be coming up next week. And if I ask you for do, to do that, um, there's going to be a specific way I'm going to ask you to do it. From, I might say something like, you know, take an image of your scratch work and send it up. I don't want images from different websites, okay? So if you're using a website to figure out your problem, that won't suffice, okay? So, um, and there's other uh, websites out there that do it. You have to probably do it in some kind of written form uh, or using Microsoft Word or something um, if I get you guys to show your work at all, all right? Um, so that's coming up next week. And again, I'm kind of going through the decision process there. I've kind of, you know, kind of mulled through my brain a little bit. And the reason for this is because I want to be fair. And I want to be fair about the time frame that you have. So the more complex I make this test, the more people are going to panic and be nervous about it. And I really don't want that. This is more of a chance for us to go through and um, review the material that I've already given you for the first six weeks of class. All right, so this is a cheat sheet that can help you with that to make your answers quicker and to be able to refer to something. And typically, and here's something that I always get. Well, if you put it on the cheat sheet, that's probably going to be on the test. Yes. It's probably going to be on the test. If I've given you a cheat sheet like this, chances are you're going to see something, you know, that is related to these questions on the test. 
Miguel says, what if we are guessing and we do not solve the problem? Well, better to submit something than nothing, I always say. Right? You're not going to lose marks for giving the wrong answer. You're going to lose marks. Well, sorry. You're not going to lose marks for giving uh, a guessed answer if it's right. Right. And you don't have any feedback, you know, as an example, necessarily. If you don't answer at all, you'll you, it's like you've given up you've, if you if you don't answer. Right. So. Um, so don't forfeit your answers. Don't just like skip by and, and submit um, your test without an answer. I'd rather you answer even if you're guessing the closest, the best guess or the best, you know, kind of uh, you want to answer with the best answer. So that's the answer for you. OK, so that is, um, you know, your cheat sheet. So please take a look at that. Please download it. Um, I've put it together for you guys so you guys can access it anytime you want. And it's here in week six. OK, so you can get access to this thing. Um, and it's typically the same one I give every year, but um, sometimes I add things to it. Um, this year I haven't done much to it, but, you know, can we see all the questions at the same time? I will make them available to you so you can see them all at the same time. Absolutely. I know some people only want to do one question at a time, no backtracking and all that stuff. I'm not going to make it that type of exam. All right? I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it that way, Neil. I, I wouldn't like it if I was a student, and I, I, I'm not going to do it to you guys. All right? It doesn't make sense to me. And why? Because, you know, I want you guys to, again, strategies for me is whenever I write an exam is I always want to be able to answer the questions that I know immediately as fast as possible. So go through the entire exam. In real life, you'd have an exam paper, right? And you go through the exam and you pick the questions that you know, and that might be a strategy for you. Um, whereas if I don't have any backtracking and I can only answer one question at a time, once I've gone and left one question, it's done whether I answered it or not, right? So I I know it's more strict, but I think back no backtracking and uh, that kind of stuff is bad. However, one thing I will men mention to you is that every exam, because it's a Blackboard test, will be delivered to you in a randomized order. So it's randomized multiple choice, true, false type questions that, you, that are going to come right at you, okay? So at the end of the day, when it gets spun to you, every test is going to be different, even every attempt between tests. So for example, I have... The, the test that I'm getting and I'm doing two attempts. Both attempts would be very different. You might do maybe not so good in the first attempt and you, you try a second one and now you're getting different questions, right? So it's a whole pile of more questions. By the way, there's nothing wrong with doing both attempts because, uh, and this is something people um, are freaked out about as well, because I'm going to take the highest attempt out of the two. It doesn't matter if the first one was higher than the second one. It's not going to hurt you to do another attempt, but it means an extra hour of work. Or an extra, the time frame you're going to have to spend is that, that time frame. All right, so that's what's happening for next week. Um, again, more details to be released shortly. Um, one thing to note is that next Thursday, at the same time frame that we're in right now, uh, I won't have new lecture material. So there's no new lecture material next Thursday, but rather I'm going to be using this time frame and pre presenting this time frame for you so that way you can use the time frame from 11 to 2 to do your test. Okay, that's what it's for. It's not for you to get more material. At that point, I don't think you're going to be interested in any more material, just your test. So I'm not going to deliver more stuff next week. I'm going to be here to reset you if you've got a technical issue or something like that. And I'll be available between 11 and 2 just for you. If there's a problem or if there's a question error or something else like that, I'm here for you to make sure you can do that. Neil says, I have to scan when I show my work and that can take time. So can we get a bit of extra time? Yeah, absolutely. If Again, if, if I want you to show your work, then I'll incorporate that time frame. Um, and Sam says, available here or on Discord? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. It's all on Blackboard, Sam. So that's where it's going to be. That's the test. It's not going to be an oral exam. It's going to be a true, false, multiple choice type test on Blackboard. Oh, my availability will be here. I'll be on uh, on Zoom. I'll kind of come up on Zoom. I'll also be available on on, on uh, Discord, but um, um, I'll be on Zoom so we can still join the meeting if you want to. And I'll uh, I'll kind of leave the meeting uh, door open, if you will, for the entire time frame. So that way you can come on board. If there's also office hours, any question you have about anything, uh, we can go through that. All right, so that is upcoming. The other thing that I want to mention is assignment two. I've had several requests for an extension for assignment two. People have said that uh, they're running late. 
Um, they're having some challenges with assignment two. So I've kind of come to the realization that you guys need more time. Now there's a thing with this. Let's take a look at our assignments here, okay? It's just to, to, to see. This assignment is due Friday, October 15th, 2021 at midnight. Um, and I know from some of you, you're struggling to get this done by tomorrow, all right? There's more details on this one than there was in the last one. So what I'm willing to do for you, for most of you, is move the due date to Sunday, right? To give you this additional time frame. So I'll give you a couple more days. I don't want to ruin your weekend, but it's something, all right? So that's what I'm willing to do. So week six, we'll say it's updated. Okay, that's what we're going to say here. So it'll give everybody a chance to um, to do their assignment uh, by Sunday. So let's make this red and bold. And we'll say Sunday, October, what is it, the 17th? The 17th by midnight. Okay, so that's when the new due date is. And I will update that uh, accordingly up here. So... Uh, the due date now officially is the Sunday by midnight. Okay, that's when it is. And we're going to continue to display until Thursday. Okay, so what the display until means is let's suppose you can't get it done by Sunday and you need an extra day. You'll get a penalty for handing in, uh, submitting it late, but you can still submit it up until next Thursday. All right, that's what it means. All right, so that's the, uh, the way it works. So again, Updated Sunday, October 17th. It's a bit of a of an extension. Um, now, announcements still don't work great on Blackboard. So even if I um, if I make an announcement for this, some people don't check the announcements. So please, um, if there's people that are missing today from your section, please let them know that it's moved to Sunday. If your partner is not here physically today, um, make sure you move them to Sunday. Neil said, I used vectors in the crate class and did all the math in the play scene. Is that a good method as far as the data structures part go? Um, you use the vectors in the play scene. I mean, I think vectors are always good to use. Um, it's just a matter of whenever I look at, uh, you know, the assignments, I want flexibility with uh, by using um, I am GUI or some other controls, right? That's what I look at. So, yes, you figured out the the answer in the, in the assignment piece, but I want to be able to use dials or buttons or something to, to adjust the same scenario with different numbers, all right? That's what I want your, your assignment to support, which is what the assignment says. Yeah, as long as you have those, uh, how you solved it um, on the back end is okay with me. Um, and if you say vectors, like as in a standard vector, like an array, uh, or if you mean vectors as in a vector two, a vector three, I'm, a, I'm fine with that too. But however you do it is up to you. All right, so that is um, that is assignment. So again, assignment two, just for those people that uh, don't know um, and they're just coming in right now, is extended until Sunday, October the 17th, 2021 at midnight for you and for your partner. Okay, so that's pretty good. Hopefully that helps you. Uh, for some people that makes it worse because now it's on the Sunday and then their whole weekend is blown, right? And I don't want that, but it's better than Friday, right? So... Um, it gives you, it kind of alleviates some of the stress. There might be other assignments that you are competing with, uh, other things that are happening at the same time uh, that are due. And, I, and this gives you me a couple days for you to do that. All right, questions around uh, anything, like any questions or concerns around the upcoming assignment too? Okay, so things we've covered so far are Midterm tests as a review one more time. Next week, I'll say it one more time before we stop recording today. Next week, it's true, false, multiple choice. It starts at the beginning of the week and we have the entire week to do it, multiple attempts. And uh, you have a time limit um, and I've given you a cheat sheet. So please take a look at the um, at the week six content area for the cheat sheet. Okay, so that's midterm. And your assignment two has moved to uh, the end of the week, Sunday. Um, you know, as an example, to help you guys out. Sophia has a question. Uh, for the diagram for question E, are the two free body diagrams okay or should we include a third? Okay, let's take a look at um, that question. So this is good. I'm, I'm liking assignment questions because we can clarify some of those things now before you submit. So let's bring up assignment two.
All right. So, um, E. Loot crate. Okay. So, here we go. You mean A. Compute the free body diagram of the loot crate at time zero. All right, so that means that at the top of the of the of the ramp is where you want to compute the uh, free body diagram. We're going to do that in there. Uh, for C, it says uh, the loot crate leaves the ramp and moves into a flat surface that has some friction. Compute the free body diagram there. So that's two, right? If your kin uh, coefficient of kin kinetic friction is 0.42, calculate the new net force and acceleration. So this is two free body diagrams. And that's it. I think that should be good enough. Miguel says, so the test can be done at any day during the next week. Yes, any day you want, including the day that we're, we're together. No problem. All right. So that way it gives you some flexibility on, on everything that's happening. All right. If there's no more questions, we're going to get into the meat and bones of the, the details today. Let's get into it. Um, there's lots to cover again and not a lot of time. Lots of slides, but we're going to go through it quickly. Patrick says, can we draw the ramp using lines? You mean in the, the simulation, Patrick? I mean, you could, but it's just not going to look great. <laughs> it's, you're supposed to make it so it's a scene in, of, of a game kind of thing. So, yes, you could do that. Worst case scenario. Um, all right. So let's talk about energy. All right. So a bunch of problems uh, that we're using Newton's laws, and we can, we can solve a bunch of them, right, just by using Newton's laws of physics that we've seen so far, all right? We can use 1D motion, which is what we've talked about already. So here's some review. In the first week, we talked about um, kind of geometry and trig. Geometry and trig won't really be on your test. Um, there might be one question, but typically what I'm going to do for the midterm test is get questions from each week uh, to include. Motion in one direction, we talked about motion only across one axis. Right, motion in two direction. We talked about motion on two axes, and then we fed into that fed into uh, Newton's laws of motion, and um, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. F, that's force, is equal to m a mass times acceleration. And the last one is for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. That is the three laws of motion. Then we talked last week about circular motion and how they extend Newton's laws. Uh, from linear motion to circular. And this week we're talking about energy of a system and how that works alongside Newton's law. So sometimes we can be solved with Newton's laws, but they're very difficult because of, you know, uh, maybe there's some information that's missing. So the concept of energy is something that is an important topic in science and engineering. When we think about the idea of energy transfer, when we transfer energy from one system to the other, um, that is something that is interesting or even applicable to us, even as game uh, game dev or you know physics for games uh, students. Let's talk about this, right? So again, um, the idea of energy hard to define, but developed by Newton's contemporaries uh, Leibniz and Bernoulli, right? Um, it described energy as a living force. Again, I could have had another slide on just Leibniz and Bernoulli. They were very interesting people as well. Um, energy is defined as the capacity for doing work. So there's some new terminology for you, right? Energy is a state variable, and that means that it's used to characterize, characterize a physical state of an object, okay? And energy, work, and force are all closely related, okay? So this is something you should uh, consider as well. Um, so the source of a force that performs work must possess some kind of a level of energy. And objects, we know objects can store energy. Objects can store energy. And when work is performed, part or all of the stored energy of an object is converted to work. We're going to talk about these terms. What does work mean from a physics perspective? And what does it not mean? We might think about work, um, you know, Neil's asking if it's going to be part of our test or not. Um, I don't know. I don't think that uh, energy of a system is on it because I didn't include it in the cheat sheet. But uh, let's continue. I'll let you know. Um, so, so then energy 
is a the capacity to do work, and we usually measure that in joules. Okay, now think about energy in joules. And there's two types of energy we care about, potential energy and kinetic energy. Let's talk about what those two things are, right? So there's other types of energy that, um, that we can also mention that are physics-related. Remember, we also have to mention some physics-related terms that are not part of the course that if you're interested in, if, you're, if you want to be you know, more of an engineer or uh, this inspires you to do more physics learning, that's great. But things that we're not going to cover are chemical energy, thermal energy, nuclear energy, radiant energy, or electric energy. We're not going to cover any of those things. We're only going to cover mechanical energy, the energy of movement and position, because that is related to our work in games. Okay? So that stuff, so all of this, if you were going to do a real physics course, all this might be covered from an energy perspective. There might be a course called physics, whatever the number is, energy, right? And you could even break that down further later on in, um, in later years at university, and it'd be things like thermal energy, you know, or something like that, a more specific version, more details. So let's talk about mechanical energy, which is what we really care about. Again, mechanical energy, two types of mechanical energy. There's potential energy, and that is energy of position, as well as kinetic energy, energy of motion. All right, so mechanical energy, the complete, the sum of all mechanical energy we talk about in a system is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. We add those two together, and we have the total energy of a system. Okay. So when we use a, an analysis model, again, we're going to use a particle model, um, just like we've done through the entire semester so far, right? And um, systems are introduced. Think about systems as containers, right? And there's three ways to store energy in a system, okay? Three ways that we're going to talk about. So what is a system? A system is some kind of small portion of the universe. Think about it as a little pocket dimension, all right? Like we saw in the latest What If? Uh, Marvel's what if, a little pocket dimension. And, um, you know, if we think about what a system is, it's like a micro universe, if you will. If we can take a look at a slice of the, of the, of the current universe in real life, or in your game, it's like the game universe, the game world, right? That is the system itself. We could also go even further down and specify different, um, uh, subsystems that are inside of the, of the, the game world itself. And again, we're going to ignore details of the rest of the universe. We don't care about the stars, the planets, at least not for now, uh, for energy. And one thing is, it's a critical skill to identify the system that we're talking about and what the system means. That's the first step, really, in, in solving a problem is what system are we, are, are we affecting with the energy? A valid system may be a single object or particle. It could be a single game object, okay, as an example. Or it may be a collection of game objects or particles. Example would be uh, maybe there's more than one game object that makes up a, uh, a character, um, you know, a player game object. So you could have things like the head and the legs and the arms. And those are a collection of game objects inside the character game object, right? Um, it may be a region of space, some kind of part of your, uh, your game world, right? And we, it may vary with time in size and shape. So how big the energy, might, the system might get larger or it might get smaller or it might, get, it might change in shape. So that's things about what a valid system is. And it's important to understand this because it's the first part, like I said, of the analysis. So again, um, one thing to note is we want to be able to identify the need for a system approach. Sometimes we just can't use Newton's laws uh, easily. And so we sit there and say, hmm, maybe we can use energy of a system to solve the problem, right? And the other thing is, what type of system do we need? As well as, what is the system boundary? A lot of times the system boundary coincides with our collision bounds, all right? So whatever our collision boundary is, the system boundary and those are related, right? And what we wanna think about is, what is a system boundary, but rather an imaginary surface that divides the universe into the system and the environment? Okay, so again, not necessarily coinciding with the real surface, but usually it's some kind of collision boundary, typically, and the environment that surrounds the system itself. So two parts. So I separate the environment, the game world, from the system, whether it's a collision boundary, a character, an object, whatever it's going to be. 
okay, or a vehicle. So force, force applied to an object in empty, in empty space, the system is the object, okay? And its surface is the system boundary. That's one thing to understand. The force is an influence, some kind of influence that we have on the system from its environment, okay? That acts across the system boundary. This is really, really cool, this idea of how force acts across the system boundary. Or what I like to think about is I transmit this force. I communicate the force from the environment across the system boundary to the object, whatever that object is. Okay, this is kind of high level understanding. All right, let's talk about work. So work W done on the system by an agent exerting a constant force on the system is the product of a magnitude F of the force and then the magnitude uh, delta R of the displacement, all right? From the point of application of the force and cos theta where theta is the angle between the force and the displacement vectors. All right, that's a big kind of terminology, but that means that work is distinctly different in physics than in every day, all right? So it doesn't mean the same thing. And work is done by some part of the environment that is interacting with the system. And its work is done on the system. It's applied to the system itself, not to maybe objects within the system individually, but the whole system or the frame of reference, we can say, um, itself. Example, I might be doing work on a game object. The game object could be made of sub-objects that are inside the game object that are moving with the game object. They're there's locomotion, the whole game object is moving, or maybe there's even some animation inside the game object, but that game object is moving as a result of the force that's applied to it from the environment, the game world, on to the, for the system itself, which is the game object, okay? Across the system boundary, typically the, the colliding, the, 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 the collision network, if you will. All right. So we can say that work then when it comes to a formula is equal to force times delta r cos theta. This is very interesting because force is in there. Remember, when I have force, I can convert it with Newton's laws to mass times acceleration, which means I could say that work is equal to ma r delta r cos theta, right? And once I do cos theta, that means that remember when I ever have a work, and this is, there's got to be some distance, some kind of displacement, right? So the displacement is that point of application of the force from the point to wherever it's going to go. We're going to displace an object or a, a system, if you will, from one location to the other. Okay, question. If I have, if, if a force does no work on the object, the force does not move through a displacement. An example, if I have no displacement, I have no work, okay? So the work done by a force on a moving object is zero when the force is applied perpendicular to the displacement of its point application. All right, so that's important as well. So here's an example, guys. I'm pushing against a wall. I'm a bodybuilder or I'm the Hulk. Doesn't matter. I'm a superhero and I'm pushing against the wall. The wall is stronger than I am, right? But I'm exerting all kinds of energy, right? Like my own personal energy, I'm saying pushing against this wall, but the wall fails to move. Have I done any work from a physics perspective? No, no work, no displacement, no work. If I push the wall through, if I'm actually able to go through the wall and I push the wall down, then I've done some work. Until I do, it doesn't matter how much exertion, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm using my, I'm, I'm exerting myself uh, as an actor unless I push the boundary, the system boundary, so that it moves the system in some way or another, literally displacing it from, from the point of origin forward, right? Remember, displacement rather than distance, right? Then I have done zero work. That's an important consideration. So again, the displacement is that point of the application of force. If the force is applied to a rigid object or a rigid body, right, if you will, that can be modeled as a particle the displacement is the same as that of the particle. So if I move the particle, which is the center of mass, from one point to the other, then I can say that I've done some work, typically. Now, one thing is, 
we're not going to be saying anything about deformable systems. For a deformable system, something like soft body, soft rigid body, uh, instead of a rigid body system, a soft body system in physics, then it's not the same um, when it comes to rigid bodies. Soft bodies have multiple points of mass that shift around, and so we can't use the same thing. Neil says, what if my, my feet slip backwards? Well, but again, I'm applying, remember, across the system boundary. If I'm pushing against a wall, as an example, and even if my feet slip backwards, I haven't moved the wall. That's the system I'm trying to affect, the wall and anything past the wall. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to exert force across the system boundary. Nothing is working. No work done. Doesn't matter about my feet. That means the environment, which is me, is not really applying uh, any force, enough force to move uh, the system boundary. Here's some work example. The normal force and the gravitational force do no work on the object. Okay, this is an important thing. So here's our free body diagram. You can see that the normal work, normal force here in this case, because normal force is pushing up, but we're not moving, there's no displacement. And in this case, the uh, gravity has no work because I'm not moving an object. Therefore, they don't do anything. There's no work being done on the y-axis here in this scenario, right? The only work that's being done is on the x-axis, right? And it's not being done by the normal force or gravitational force. It's being done by the, the vector, the, the force vector that's being applied. So I can still de uh, deconstruct, if you will, or decouple the x and y components of, of this force vector so that I have some energy that's being displaced on the y-axis and some other energy that's being displaced on the x-axis. But really, we care about cos theta, right, as an example. Uh, where cos theta, if cos is 90 degrees, then um, cos of 90 is zero, and therefore there's no work perpendicular to the, to the direction of the force being applied. Okay? So again, we can say that the force F is the only force that does the work on the object itself, not the normal force or the, or the gravitational force. So the sign of the work depends on the direction of the force relative to the, to the displacement for the origin. Work is positive when uh, projection of the force onto the displacement is in the same direction as the displacement. So example, if I'm displacing to the right and my force is to the right, then we can say that work is positive. Work is negative when the projection is in the opposite direction, right, of the displacement. Okay? The work done by a force can be calculated by the force, but it's not necessarily the cause of the displacement. One thing to know is work is a scalar quantity, not a vector, right? And again, we talked about uh, the unit of work as a joule, or kilograms times meters per second squared, meters squared per second squared. Or we can also say that one joule is a newton meter. That's also an important consideration because of that component, which is force, right? Force is mass times acceleration, and meter is the total displacement, right? How many? How much displacement do I have? How much? How many newtons am I using to displace an object, right? And how far do I go, right? That is one joule for every joule. Um. Work is energy transfer. I love that idea. The idea of I'm transferring energy or I'm transmitting energy across the, the uh, system boundary. If the work is done in a system and it is positive energy uh, is transferred to it, then we say, um, you know, that we're all good to go. It's positive. If the work done in the system is negative, energy is transferred from the system. So we're transferring energy to a system. We can also transfer energy from a system. If the system interacts with its environment, this interaction can be described as a transfer of energy across the system boundary, which is what we talked about earlier with the wall example. What will this be used for in a game? Okay, well, any kind of, we can, we can use uh, energy of a system to describe things like motion, collisions, all those kind of things, um, and also momentum later on. Scalar product of two vectors. So. When we think about the the two vectors that we have here, right, we can see that the scalar product of vectors is written as a dot b. It's also called the dot product. So a dot b is um, equal to a b cos theta, right? So if I have two forces, as an example, 
Theta is the angle between A and B. And we have two forces acting on a system. Applied to work, this means that work is equal to the force times the displacement cos theta, which is equal to the force times delta R. Okay, that's what it is. Again, we're just simplifying the same formula over again. What about power? So we have force, we have work, and now we have power. What is power? Power is work over time, right? How much work have I done over a time frame? How long am I applying that work? That's power. And usually it's in terms of joules per second or watts. We may hear about this as watts as well, okay? So joules per second or watts, right? Work over time. Here's an example. Um, how about, sorry, uh, work done by a varying force. To use work, this formula, work is equal to F uh, delta R cos theta, the force must be constant so that the equation cannot be used to calculate the, the, the work done by a varying force. So where I kind of vary my, the amount of force over time. Okay, that's not what we want to do. Assume that the, during a very small displacement, F, the force, is constant. All right, these very small displacements. And of course, what we can do is we can sum up all the intervals. Once we talk intervals, I'm thinking calculus again, so that we can come up with um, that. That's how we would break it down. So we can vary the amount of force. So force on the x-axis and then displacement across the x-axis. Uh, sorry, force on the y-axis and displacement across the x-axis here, right? So the amount of force that varies, we can break it, slice it down into smaller slices uh, with this kind of and create a curve and whenever we think about the area under a curve we're thinking about integration right again calculus so that's what they've done here and I'm not going to go through this because we were you know we're, we're not talking about calculus uh, in this course but I want you to understand how we would figure things out if we if our force was variable um, what about work by multiple forces? Um, if the system cannot be modeled as a particle for some reason, then the total work is equal to the algebraic sum of the work done by the individual forces. So what we say is the sum of all forces across the x-axis, sum of all forces across the y-axis, the z-axis, and so on. And when we get all that together, we come up with a scalar that, that you know, kind of uh, is the sum of the, or the, uh, the algebraic sum of the forces. How about springs? Okay, so here's something. Uh, work can also be done by springs, right? Because if you think about it, we have an object and um, there's three states of a spring. We haven't really talked about springs so far this semester, but here's something new. Three states of a spring. I can say that the first state, state A, is when the string is stretched. So I've stretched a string, a spring, beyond its uh, natural state if you will, or natural length or uh, area of equilibrium. So B would be the spring in equilibrium. There's not moving at all, right? So we can stretch a spring. There's also compression. I can compress, compress a, string, a spring. So it's the displacement is, is kind of closer to the spring's origin or tether, if you will, right? So here I am pulling it. This one, I'm pushing it. Both are different kinds of states. And they also have different forces involved. And let's talk about these a little bit. So the block is on a horizontal frictionless surface in this scenario. So we don't care about friction uh, from this, all things being equal. <clears throat> we want to talk about, we want to model the, uh, the system as a particle. We want to think about uh, what a spring does. One thing we, we're going to use is, one half kx squared max, um, where we're thinking about where kx squared um, is the coefficient of the, sp the, the spring constant, or we want to talk about the stiffness of the spring, is something that we're going to use similar to what we did with friction, where we had a coefficient of friction. We have a coefficient of the stiffness of a spring that we're going to use to, to uh, help us with the force okay, that we're going to generate. So Hooke's law, right, is it gives us this information. Again, we're not going to go into details about Hooke's law. Just know that it's called Hooke's law. For us, it's not that important. But the idea is that we have some kind of stiffness, 
So we can say the force of stiffness, not the static friction. That's kind of labeled the same. But it's equal to negative kx, where x is the position of the block and k is the spring constant. Okay, the spring constant. K measures the stiffness of the spring. Again, this is called Hooke's law, stiffness of a spring. So why is it negative Kx? Well, because it's a force is applied. The, the amount of force being applied is, is opposite of the direction that we're, pull, that we're pulling or pushing it. Example, here I'm displacing a spring outside of its natural state. Let's call this the origin. By pulling it, stretching it, Right when I stretch a spring, we can see that the force is in the opposite direction. The what it's wanting to do, the natural state of the spring, the spring wants to go back to the to to its natural state. So the force is being applied in the opposite direction of the displacement. So too, when it comes to compression. Okay, so I'm going to go to the compression example. Uh, let's go back to, to compression. When I compress a spring. I'm pushing the spring, so I'm compressing it outside of its state of equilibrium or natural state, and the force, the resultant force, is going to push me back towards its natural state. If anything, actually, this is an interesting model because it models not just springs but other things. You know, uh, sometimes physicists, we've had some really wacky conversations with physicists where they say Hooke's law also pertains to relationships and personalities, right? Or we can say that and this is a, a mnemonic for me. Whenever I was remembering Hooke's law, we weren't allowed any any kind of uh, formula when I was doing physics. But we can think about that. You know, we can stretch our personality to try and be different, or compress our personality when we're forced to. But at the end of the day, our personality will always want to go back to its natural state, right? And I know that's kind of weird to think about it. It's kind of an esoteric thing. But physics can be pretty esoteric as well. And what that means is you want to try and please people a lot of times. So you stretch your personality beyond its natural state, right? And your personality has some kind of stiffness or cohesion that's going to try and drag you back to its natural state, right? Same thing with compression. You want to constrain somebody or stop somebody from doing something, right? And they're just going to do what's natural for them. Most of the time, we just bounce around and do what's natural. And so does a spring. A spring always bounces around until it reaches its natural state again. Okay. So kind of a, a mnemonic. I know it's not the most, the best analogy, but it's how I remembered it when I was learning physics. All right. So, um, so the vector form of Hooke's law, again, uh, you know, the force vector, uh, which is based on the, uh, the force of a spring. The vector is equal to the force across the x-axis, the x component, which is a negative kx, right, across the x component. Remember, i represents the uh, the the x-axis, as an example. When x is positive, the spring is negative. The force is negative. And when x is zero, then we can say that the uh, or at the equilibrium or natural state, f is zero, so the force is zero. And when x is negative then the force is positive because of this negative kx um, relationship. So, again, we can say that the force exerted by the spring is always directed opposite to the displacement from the equilibrium. The spring force is sometimes called the restoring force, right? And if the block is released, it will oscillate back and forth between x, negative x and x until it reaches equilibrium. Okay, until it releases, releases uh, or reaches equilibrium, which is important. How about work done by a spring? Right. So the work done by a spring, or Ws, right? Um, we can calculate it. What's been done on a block? It moves from the x initial is equal to negative x max to x final, right? So that's what we can say. There's negative x max and positive x max. And we can see that um, it's an interval. So the spring, the spring force, we can say that, remember, it varies in terms of how much force is being exerted. And in a, in a, in a varying force, remember we have varying force, we need to use uh, a time slice, you know, of the force being exerted over time. And that varying force is usually something that we, we take different time slices and incorporate together or integrate. And so 
integration can be used to help us uh, figure out the total force being exerted over time. Okay. And that's why we use this right here. So work, the, the work of a spring is equal to the integral from x initial to x final, because again, this is the displacement, right? And again, if you guys don't know uh, calculus, it's okay. I'm just going to go through the equation really quickly, which is of negative kx uh, with respect to x, right? And which is equal to one half kx i squared over two. So that's so. So in other words, like half kx squared over two initial minus half kx squared. Uh, over two, or, or kx squared over two final, right? So initial minus final, take all the force that's in there, right? And we can come up with a um, uh, with the total force exerted for across uh, those how far it goes, right? And usually it's it's relation uh, it's relational. So if I pull a if I displace a spring, uh, if I displace a spring here by pulling it. When again, this is assuming that the surface is uh, frictionless, like ice, in, as an example, ice on, you know, steel on ice, like a puck. Uh, as an example, it's frictionless or near frictionless. Then what's going to happen is across a horizontal surface, it's going to continue to go oscillate back and forth. And eventually uh, the energy is going to be lost and um, it's going to end up at zero, right? So here's a question for you guys. How does the energy get lost if this is a frictionless surface? Where does the energy go? So it's going to isolate. It's not going to isolate forever. Patrick says into the spring. But where does the energy go? I mean, I had energy. I pulled a spring, right? And as such, I've applied energy across the system boundary. I've given energy to the system. The system is a spring. Okay, so I've pulled it out open. And once I've pulled it, it has this energy, right? And now it's going to continue to oscillate back and forth. And then it's going to continue to slow down slowly, slowly, slowly. What's slowing it down? If it was a frictionless surface, what would it be that's slowing it down? You know, it says the collisions of the spring. Uh, Sam says it's, it, it depends on the rigidity of the spring. It does. All these things, the stiffness. Dispersion of energy. How did we, okay, Nihar, how do I disperse energy? Where, where does the energy go? What kind of energy am I dispersing? Miguel says, no idea. Well, remember that energy, this is very interesting. Yes, sound, sound, heat, um, all that kind of stuff. Energy, remember, is being lost. Here's an example. And when I have a collision, right, energy is being lost in the collision. It's not a perfect collision. There's no, there's elastic. We're going to talk about this later on the semester. There's elastic and inelastic collisions, right? If it's a purely elastic collision, that means no energy is lost right? If it's an inelastic collision, some energy is lost. And most collisions we deal with in life are inelastic, which means some energy is being lost. Example, a car hitting another car, some energy is being lost. Why? The car is crumpling. The sound that it's making, the deformation of the system, that is where energy is being lost. Heat, uh, smoke, fire, all that kind of stuff. Sparks, that's just energy. Energy can never, neither be created or destroyed right? So where is that energy going? It's going in terms of sound. It's going somewhere, okay? So we're going to talk about that soon. Um, talk about work done by a string. And <clears throat> okay, so suppose an external agent F uh, stretches the string. The applied force is equal to uh, F applied, right, across the x-axis, which is a negative Fs, where F is the force of the spring, negative Fs, which is equal to a negative, negative Kx uh, I, which is equal to a Kx I. So if it's the force applied across the system is equal and opposite to the spring force. That's what it means. Work done by the force that we apply on a spring as the block moves from negative X max to X is equal to zero, is equal to negative uh, half kx squared max. Okay, that's the stuff that we want to talk about. And for any displacement, the work done by the, the applied force is the integral of x initial to x final of kx uh, with respect to x. Okay. 
let's talk about, and we'll leave it there when it comes to um, a spring for now. We're going to hear more about about springs when it comes to um, collisions. We're going to think we're going to hear more about springs with the energy of a system. But for now, let's leave it where it is. We're going to just we're going to kind of describe springs and the force that's being uh, that's in a spring differently. Let's talk about kinetic energy. One possible result of work acting uh, as an influence on the system is this that the system changes its speed. Right. This system could possess something called kinetic energy. So kinetic energy then is one half mv squared. Okay, kinetic energy where K is the kinetic energy itself, M is the mass of the particle that we're moving, and V is the speed of the particle. So the total kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared. A change into the kinetic energy is one possible result of doing work to transfer energy into a system, across the system boundary. Okay, so this is your first equation. K is equal to one-half mv squared. It looks very similar, doesn't it? We've seen stuff like this before. Well, this is interesting. So again, where we say the external work is equal to the, we calculate work, we can use um, integration, right, as an example. But what this integration does is it boils down into something that we can see down here, which means that um, work external is equal to the um, kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial, which is the, the change in kinetic energy. Right, so that changed what we were measuring. Again, we're getting to it with um, with integration, but this is the proof. This is us getting into you know using integration to get to this equation right here. Right, so at the end of the day, what we're having is we have a mass, and if the the speed changes, you know, as an example, whatever the speed changes is, and we have a change in displacement, so we displace a mass from position m here where it is. To here to this uh, this point here we know we've done work because there's been displacement we know that that's that's true and we can calculate uh the amount of work done based on the mass that we're moving as well as uh the you know the the uh, square of the speed okay so relating work to energy so this is interesting energy initial plus some kind of work is equal to energy final Right, so I have some initial energy of a system, whatever that energy is. I'm adding work to it. I got new energy. I got some other kind of energy happening at the end. Right? We can break it further. We can break it down further. This breaks down even more, where we can say that energy initial. Remember that energy is both. There's two types of energies we care about: kinetic energy and potential energy. We'll talk about the differences in a second. Right? But we have kinetic energy initial plus. Um, Potential energy initial plus some kind of work is so we've changed the system is equal to kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. Okay, this is important. So note that work can be either positive or negative, right? Positive work increases the amount of energy, negative work decreases the amount of energy. Okay, and a lot of times we have a combination of positive and negative work and we get some kind of applied force. Right, and we kind of it's additive. We add it all together, the sum of all forces, as an example of the sum of all work, and then we get the final result. Right, where work is, uh, you know, the the amount of force across a displacement cos theta. This idea is very very important to, to keep in mind. Notice that again, work is a scalar, and the force vector as well as the displacement, the direction of displacement. Um, they kind of combine to give us the idea of where the work is happening or in which direction. All right, so here's something. This is the work kinetic energy theorem, all right, where we can say that external work, work done on an, uh, from an external, uh, you know, kind of uh, actor across the energy, the system boundary is equal to the kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial, which is delta K or the change in kinetic energy. We can say that. When work is done in a system and the only change in the system is speed, then the net work done on the system equals the change of kinetic energy of the system itself. All right? And the speed of the system increases if the work done on it is positive, and it decreases if the work done is negative. Guys, have we seen this kind of thing before? Accelerating, decelerating. Right? We can start thinking about 
use cases where we can use our energy of a system to solve the same problems we can, we, we've solved with Newton's laws with these simple equations. Um, the work kinetic energy theorem is not valid if other changes besides speed occur in the system or if there are other interactions with the environment besides work. Okay, And the work kinetic energy theorem applies to the speed of the system, not its velocity. So not displacement necessarily, but it's all around uh, speed. Okay, So distance travel. So we can say that the network is equal to the change in kinetic energy or kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. Okay, so example, what is the network required to accelerate a three kilogram object from two meters per second to four meters per second? Okay, we can say that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, right? And so we can say that one half mv squared final minus one half mv squared initial. That's the you know the net work that's been done. So let's plug in some numbers. So the final is four, right? That's the, the final velocity is four. We math, the mass is three for both cases. And when we do our multiplication, uh, we multiply it out. We have 24 minus six, which works out to 18 joules of net work that's been done on the system. So when we went, we accelerated an object from three kilograms, that's three kilograms from two meters per second to four meters per second, joules. So this is interesting. This relationship is interesting because now we have, we've gone from kinetic energy and we've converted it to mass and speed. And once we can convert something to mass and speed, my friends, we have mass. And that means we can get, we can figure out forces, right? And once we can figure out forces, we have acceleration, right? We can do a lot of stuff here. Um, just with these kinds of equations, which, which, which I will show you in a few slides. All right, let's talk about potential energy. So this is the energy that is stored in an object, okay? So it's determined by the configuration of a system. The forces are internal to the system with when it comes to potential energy. And it can be associated with only specific types of forces acting between members of a system. Let's think about what this uh, uh, potential energy is. We'll talk about it in a second. A lot of times, remember we, we at the beginning of this conversation, this whole uh, thing, I said potential energy is the energy uh, related to position, right? And kinetic energy is uh, energy related to movement, right? Some kind of mechanical uh, motion, uh, as an example. So that is kinetic energy. And the total work on a system, you kind of add in, or the total system itself, we say it's, you know, initial kinetic plus initial potential, plus work is equal to final kinetic and final potential. How is this good? Well, potential energy starts us off with uh, some kind of displacement, right? Um, away from uh, the surface of an object. Example, okay, and we're going to talk about these in later slides, but let's talk about them here generally. I take a weight, an, a weight, some kind of mass, and I lift it above my head. A certain distance. Let's suppose I lift it, I can reach seven feet, okay, above the ground, some number of meters, X number of meters above the ground. I take a weight, whatever that mass is, that mass has potential energy. We can say I've given, I've transferred across the system boundary potential energy to that mass because there's a potential for that mass to fall, right? And the potential is being generated by the, the force of gravity, right? The force of gravity. So I've lifted something up and there's a potential for that mass to fall. I've given energy to that system, potential energy. Come back to this in a sec, this idea. So let's think about this. Um, so work kinetic energy theorem example, um, where we want to move a, a block, ex example from position A to position B, we have some kind of force that's being exerted. Here's the free body diagram. We have a change in position. So this is positional change or displacement, if you will. And we have some kind of uh, uh, velocity vector that we're using, right? Then we can say that the normal and gravitational forces do no work because it's basically there's no motion up or down. And because the force is perpendicular to the object that's moving, so perpendicular to the surface, or sorry, parallel to the surface, 
then we can just convert it to work external is equal to the change in kinetic energy or one half mv squared final minus zero, where zero, we just started off at zero, and now we have some motion later on. So we've moved something from position A to position B, where position A, the, the, the object was at rest, and now position B, the object is in motion. Okay, think about the relationships again that we can use. So when it comes to potential energies of different kinds, and I mentioned this already, gravitational potential energy, right? Um, is such that we want to calculate, let's suppose here they're using a physics book and we're displacing it across the y-axis where the y-axis is the height. The higher up we're displacing it, the more potential energy it's going to gain. So we can say that the earth book earth system is uh, mass times gravity y final across the y-axis final is minus mass times gravity across the y-axis initial, right? So the initial position and the final position, we multiply mass times gravity, we can figure out that um, uh, what the, the potential energy gained is, whatever that gain is, right? So we can say that the change in, in position, we can use displacement where the change in position is uh, y final minus y initial across the y-axis. Remember the j is related to, to y the y-axis, and what we say is when we move an object higher up away from the Earth, that we're actually storing potential energy. We're storing potential energy into that object because if I let the object go, it's going to transfer the energy from potential energy into kinetic energy, into movement, right? Energy transfer. So assume the book in the previous is allowed to fall. Right, previous example, there's no change in kinetic energy since the book starts and ends at rest, right? There's no change. But the gravitational potential energy is the energy associated with the object at a given location above the surface of the Earth. So we can say that work external is equal to the mass times gravity uh, across the y axis final minus the initial. And then we can say that where we look at UG where U is the potential energy, UG meaning the gravitational potential energy, that's what that's how you remark upon it, we can convert this to mass times gravity times height, right? Height above the Earth or the surface that you're at right now. The unit is joules, again, and it's a scalar quantity. So how many joules of potential energy, we can say. Um, and remember that potential energy and kinetic energy energy can either be created or destroyed. So once what we're doing is we're just adding to it. We're, we're transferring energy across the system boundary into that system, right? Okay. <clears throat> and potential energy is always associated with, uh, with a system of two or more interacting objects. So the book, in this case, the physics book and the ground, two or more interacting objects. Or the book and my hand, I'm moving this thing up. How do I do that? Right? I'm displacing, I'm doing work to, to, to move it up to, the, to this area of potential energy. The gravitational potential energy depends on only on the vertical height above the Earth's surface, because that's all we care about. Gravity pulls us down towards the center of the Earth, right? And one thing we want to do is we want to choose a reference configuration, right, of where the gravitational potential energy is set equal uh, to some reference, for example, normally zero. Example would be if the object was on a surface. Um, Let's suppose um, if I put the object over a table, it can't fall to the ground unless it's super massive. It's going to break through the table or something, right? But if it's uh, if I if I can lift a physics book above the table, we can say that the table itself is the reference frame, right? That is the reference configuration where the surface of the table would be zero, and then I'm moving it above the surface x number of height, and that's going to give me my potential energy. It's above the surface that I'm talking about, where the surface is representing the Earth in this case. Okay, a, a, a lot of times having an object, um, you know, on the surface of the Earth is convenient, right? But sometimes it's not the only configuration we can use. All right, let's talk about some other kinds of potential energy. So we have uh, gravitational potential energy, but we also have elastic potential energy which is associated with the spring. Okay, back to Hooke's law again. The force of a spring is equal to negative kx, right? And so we can say that work 
right, is equal to half kx squared final, right, minus one half kx squared initial, right? That is the work that's being done on the spring. Remember that spring force is variable. There's a, there's a, the forces change. It kind of oscillates between the negative max and positive max, right, across its um, equilibrium point or its state of equilibrium until it stops moving, all right? So the work is equal to the difference between the initial and final values um, you know, of expression of the configuration system. So here's back to that example that we used before. And this is very interesting. We're gonna talk about this little graph here, which is interesting. So again, potential energy of a spring, so U, potential energy, S, the spring instead of gravity, is equal to half Kx squared, right? So let's take a further look at the system. So elastic potential energy stored in a spring is zero when the spring is not deformed. If I deform a spring, um, then it's maximum when the spring has reached its maximum extension, stretching, or compression. Okay, that's when it's maximum. And the elastic potential energy is always positive, right? Always positive. Uh, X squared will always be positive, okay? Because that's based on how much we compress it or extend it. So let's think about this. When an, uh, the spring is in equilibrium, we can look at different energy levels. Remember, this total energy is the total amount of kinetic energy plus potential energy. Because it's in equilibrium, the total potential energy right now, because there's nothing, no force being applied to it, is zero. So therefore, there's no kinetic, kinetic energy and there's no potential energy. Total energy is zero at this, uh, at this part. So here's the energy bar. Right? How about here? When I, when the spring is partially compressed, right, I increase the amount of potential energy, all right? And the total energy of the system is going higher. Why? I'm applying work to the system across the system boundary. The system boundary is the spring itself. I'm applying work to the system, okay? I'm moving a mass and I'm compressing the spring until I reach the compression maximum. When I meet, reach the compression maximum, I've got the 100% of the potential energy it can possibly have when it's fully compressed. The total energy is maxed, right? Here, the total energy is not maxed, right? As we start to compress, right? So I've increased the elastic potential energy of the system until it's maxed out. And then when I let the spring go, right? What happens is when the spring is released, there is a transfer of potential energy, right, into kinetic energy, right? So potential energy that's stored is released, and that energy that it's released is transferred to kinetic energy, but the total energy of a system is the same, right? I've applied work, and once I've applied that work, assuming that um, the surface is frictionless, it's going to keep on going back and forth, potentially forever, right? The only thing that's going to possibly slow it down is gravitational forces. Gravitational forces is going to keep on pulling it down, and depending on if the if it's a perfectly uh, if it's a perfectly frictionless surface, it can go on for a very very long time. In real life, um, it would stop because no surface is perfectly um, frictionless, right? And also the spring itself, no spring is perfect in terms of the way it compresses and it extends, there's noise. That noise is a loss of energy and heat because of the compression and extension of the spring is being generated. And so there's some energy loss. And because of that energy loss, in, a different, in, a, in addition to some minor friction, eventually the spring will come to rest in its point of equilibrium. And so it says that it's going to reach some kind of state uh, when the spring is returned to its relaxed length and the system contains only kinetic energy associated with the moving block, if there's some kind of, if the moving block itself is separated from the spring. So the moving block, it's going to keep oscillating. And as soon as the moving block leaves the spring, the energy is being transferred from the spring system to the system of the block itself across its system, system boundary, which is the collider. If this whole system was together, it would continue to oscillate back and forth, right? Because the spring itself would deform, 
it would stretch and it would move the block back and forth across um you know the 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 length of the spring or the the max x kx uh negative kx max and kx max all right so internal energy we're talking about internal energy which is all around um potential energy is internal in many ways right so think about this. So a couple of things we can say that is internal. Uh, the energy associated with an object's temperature, right, is called internal. And there's other internal energies as well. But think about this way. I have a book, right? And um, I want to transfer it, right? Transfer the book between, you know, I, I raise it up and I let, you know, gravitational potential energy. There's a swing of energies. Here we're just talking about temperature. Temperature for us, we're not really care about too much. Um, because a lot of times internal energy means temperature. Okay. Last part, conservative forces. So we can say that the work done by a conservative force on a particle moving between any two points is independent of the path taken by the particle. And so what that means is the work done by a con uh, of a conservative force on a particle moving through any closed path is zero. Remember we talked about this? energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be transferred, but it can't be created or destroyed, right? So examples of conservative forces are gravity and spring force, okay? So I'm transferring energy. I'm transferring energy, okay? So we can associate the potential energy for a system with any conservative force acting between the members of the system, right? So example, we can say that the internal work that's being used is equal to negative Delta U, where U is the change in potential energy. Positive work done by an outside agent on a system causes an increase in the potential energy of the system. So example, I raise a book up above my head. I'm, I'm the agent, and I'm, I'm acting on the system, the book, and I'm adding or storing potential energy, right? Work done on a component of the system by a conservative force internal to an isolated system caused a decrease of the potential energy. For example, I drop a book. Right, so that book now is being acted on by gravity. As the book drops, it the 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 reason why it's dropping is the potential energy is being transferred to the kinetic energy. Potential energy being transferred to kinetic energy until it hits the ground. And when it hits the ground, there's no more energy. The energy is being transferred to the ground, and thus the amount of energy is enough that's transferred to go through the ground. We can say that when it reaches the ground, there's no more, uh, the energy becomes zero, All right? But where is that energy lost? The energy is lost in sound, heat, right? And sometimes what ends up happening is there is a bounce. An object might bounce from the ground and that bounce is a reflection. Remember, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and it bounces up and it keeps bouncing until um, depending on its elasticity, or we can say um, uh, restitution. And that restitution, when it kind of, kind of bounces up, there's more energy loss, almost like a, an oscillation, like a spring, where it kind of bounces up and down, depending on the elasticity of the object. We can almost almost apply spring physics to it, right? Where it finally, you know, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, remains at rest. Okay but not to complicate things. How about non-conservative forces? So it does not satisfy the conditions of conservative forces. Non-conservative forces acting on a system cause a change in the mechanical energy. So in other words, I have my mechanical energy is the total amount of kinetic energy plus the total amount of, of potential energy. So K is all the kinetic, U is all the potential. And we can say that, um, Non-conservative forces, the work done against the friction is greater along the, the brown path, as an example, um, uh, than along the blue path, right? Why? Because, remember, it's total distance in this case as opposed to displacement. So the, the displacement is the same, but um, I'm using force across a longer distance, and the force of friction is, is acting uh, far longer on the curved path than it is on the blue path. So there's more work that's being done because of the, of remember it's, uh, the power is work over time. And so there's more work being done here. Okay. 
So again, um, conservative forces and potential energy. We want to talk about um, the total work uh, internal being the initial position and the final position. Uh, so the integral between the initial position and the final position uh, of the forces across uh, the uh, x-axis with respect to x, which normally looks at negative delta u, so the change in potential energy, where delta u is negative when f and x are in the same direction. All right. In other words, if I'm my force, force of gravity, and uh, the displacement are in the same direction, then I can say that u is negative. Why? Because I, um, you know, I'm losing potential energy. Okay. Again, these are just some thoughts. We're going to get to the meat and bones of it in a second. Bear with me. I know there's a lot here. Um, so we can say that the force across the x-axis is negative uh, delta u over delta with respect to x. Okay. And as we look at a, a deformed spring, we can still look at the same thing. This is Hooke's law and confirms the equation for potential energy. Again, I'm not going to expect you guys to look at um, uh, calculus, which is the form of calculus, to understand what it means. But just to know that we can derive the information that we get for, uh, for potential energy based on Hooke's law and calculus. That's why calculus is kind of important to understand, but not necessarily critical for games physics. The idea here is that we have potential energy and kinetic energy. That's some, th those are the important concepts here that we're going to use in a sec. All right, so we have the restoring force. Here's energy diagrams in equilibrium. Um, exerted by the spring always acts towards x is equal to zero, the, po the position of the stable equilibrium. All right, so if I put a force this way, it's going to react this way, and it's going to keep on swinging or oscillating back and forth um, until it reaches equilibrium. The block will always accelerate back toward x is equal to zero from wherever it's coming from. If I compress it, it's going to go the other way. If I extend it, it's going to go the other way. Let's look at some examples. A force of 50 newtons, all right, acts on the block at an angle shown in the diagram, all right? The block moves a horizontal distance of three meters. How much work is being done by the applied force? So. We can say that work, remember, how do we break down work? It's Newton meters, right? So 50 Newtons times the amount of displacement times cos uh, theta, where theta is the, the angle of displacement, right? The, where the, uh, the uh, force vector is, right? So we know that there's amount of force. Think also, I, you know, a lot of times I look at this thing and I'm thinking kinematic equations, kinematic equations, right? Where I have my velocity cos theta. V cos theta, right? It's kind of the same thing. So where I have the total amount of, of, of newtons of force across the total displacement, three meters, times cos of theta, or 30 degrees, we take we say that it's 150 meters, 150 times uh, root three over two, which is works out to be 129.9 joules, because work is always in joules, and it's a scalar quantity. Pretty simple, just all we're doing is subbing in for that equation. Okay, so force, mass, force times mass, F times M times cos theta. Example two, this is a little bit more detailed. Calculate the work the bull will perform to push a two meter for two meters a 10 kilogram box sitting on the ground if the coefficient of friction between the box and the ground is 0.5. Assume the box is being pulled at a constant velocity. And why? Because, again, if we push at a constant velocity, we can apply uh, different kinds of things. We can say that the force with which the bull will push the box will be equivalent to the force of friction, which is equal to m, uh, sorry, mu mg, where mu is the kinetic, the, the um, coefficient of kinetic friction times mass times gravity. So we can say that that is 0.5 times 10 kilograms, right, times 9.8 meters per second which is, works out to be 49.05 newtons. So that's the total force, okay? And the question is, calculate the work. So first, we, we, we break it down into two parts. We break it down into force first. How do I figure out the force? And then what is work, right? Again, work is the total force exerted across, uh, you know, the system boundary 
right? And how much displacement is there, right? Well, I'm displacing two meters, right? And so I say that, uh, and it's across the horizontal, which means that the angle is zero, right? So there is no angle from the ox. The ox is, or the, the bull is pulling the, uh, you know, or, or pushing a, a two meter, a 10 kilogram box. Here's the box, I'm pushing it. Well, there is no, um, there is no angle. So we can say that the we can take force multiplied by the displacement. So 49.05, which we got here, multiplied by the displacement times one, cos of zero is one, which works out to be 98.1 joules of work. Okay. So sometimes we need to do this. Sometimes we need to, to break down a problem into two pieces. One piece would be the, um, is there a conversion to watts? If we said for, if I said that, uh, Sam, I, I said something like this work was done over 10 minutes, then you could calculate, uh, you know, uh, remember it's, it's work over time, right? Okay, here's the third example. And by the way, some of these examples are going to be eerily similar to what you see on your test when it comes to, um, you know, to energy of a system when we get to that. So example, calculate the amount of work done by pulling a thousand kilogram brick of gold for three kilometers on the ground, right? At an angle of 10 degrees, if the coefficient of friction is 0.25, assume the box is being pulled at a constant velocity. Holy crap, there's so much information. Where do we go from this? How do I break it down? Okay, well, we got a lot of information. And remember what we wanna do is calculate the amount of work. And this is the key right here, right? When we see the amount of work, that's what it's asking, all right? So how do we pull this out? Well, we start thinking about all the things that we know, right? So again, uh, what I wanna do is start thinking about these things. So I say, I know that the mass is equal to 1000 kilograms, right? I know that. What else do I know, all right? I know that the displacement is three kilometers. I know that the displacement is three kilometers, which is 3000 meters, so that is S. S is equal to 3,000 meters. We know that, right? We start writing down the things that we know, right? The angle, theta, let's just use, uh, um, I don't have theta, let's use uh, theta, T, right? Or we can just use A for the angle. The angle is equal to 10 degrees, okay? That's the angle theta, right? Actually, this is right angle, or theta. We know theta is 10 degrees, okay? So we know all these things. If the coefficient of, of friction is 0.25, right, so that's mu, if you will, right? It's actually spelled mu. If mu or the coefficient of coefficient, right? If I can spell it efficient, right? Uh, is equal to 0 0.25 degrees, the 0 0.25, assume the box is being pulled at a constant velocity. These are the things we know, right? How can I get all this information so that I can, can I generate somehow force from this? First, I want to start with force. How do I figure out the force of the pull? Well, here we use some simple um, trig, right? To, we, we rejigged the equation, right? So that we say that uh, the force of the pull, right? Is equal to uh, cos theta uh, plus mu sine theta, right? Because we have two, uh, we can we can split this up into two components of the force, right? So sine theta and cos theta. And here, when whenever we're working with, uh, in this particular case, um, we sub in the value. So 0.25 would be the coefficient of static friction, right? Oh, sorry, the coefficient of friction, not static, coefficient of friction. Times mass times gravity, mass 1,000 kilograms times gravity which we know is 9.8 meters per second, right? And then we divide that by the um, the angle that's being pulled, right? And we must add the uh, the friction itself, the coefficient of friction times sine. And once we've got this, again, this comes from our, our previous equations, then we come up with something like 2,380 newtons of force. Once we have force, we can get work. Why? Because now we can sub in work is equal to force times displacement times cos of the angle. So we take that initial equation, 2380 newtons times 3000 meters. 
times cos of 10 degrees, which is work, works out to 7 times 10 to the 6th joules. 7 times 10 to the 6th joules, right? Okay, so again, I'm just showing you some examples of how this could be used. We're going to get some better ones in a sec. I know this can be somewhat cryptic when you first look at it, but once you get into it, you start to figure this out. Okay, here's something. When doing a chin-up, an athlete lifts her 55-kilogram body a distance of 0.25 meters in two seconds. Okay, so now, different information. What is the power delivered by the athlete's biceps? Okay, so power is equal to work over time. So work is equal to the force of gravity, right, times the displacement. How much am I displacing, right? Well, I'm displacing 55 kilograms, force of gravity, remember, is like 55 kilograms, mg, times gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, times the displacement, 0.25 meters, over a period of two seconds, which works out to be 67.375 watts, because power is related to watts. Last two questions. Okay, guys, what does this look like to you? I've got my loot crate, <laughs> right? It's 90 kilograms. A 90 kilograms uh, bike started at rest from the top of a 500 meter long hill with a 30 degree incline. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. We start writing stuff down, right? I know. Uh, 90 kilograms is the mass, right? And we start writing down the distance, the displacement, is going to be over time, right? 500 meters, right? And it says, assuming an average friction of 60 newtons, the 60 newtons of of, of uh, friction is happening contra to the to the direction of motion. Find the speed of the biker at the top. Uh, sorry, at the bottom of the hill, guys. It's very similar to what we saw in our loot crate. Okay, so how do we figure this out? We know that the potential energy is. Remember what potential one half or sorry, m um, a mass times gravity times height, right? Mass times gravity times height. Well, how did I figure out height, right? Well, we know that this is 500 meters. We know that the incline is 30 degrees. So I can figure out that uh, what this is right here because we can use SOKATOA back to trigonometry, right? And once we figure out trigonometry, we can figure out that the total height here is 250 meters. So we can say that 90 kilograms times 9.8 times 250 meters is uh, is the total potential energy. Okay. So think about that. So that works out to be, um, you know, and we know that the acceleration. Um, so again, we've we've been given some information here, right? So we know that this is what it's going to be here, and what we're asking is. Assume the average force of friction is 60 newtons, right? So how do I use this average force of friction uh, to find the speed of the biker at the bottom of the hill, right? And how do we get 65.06 meters per second? How do we get that? Well, we know that what's the kinetic, if you use, you know, kind of, uh, you know, work is equal to, uh, you know, or sorry, we can put two equations. The uh, potential energy plus kinetic energy plus work is equal to, that's initial, is equal to uh, potential energy plus kinetic energy final. We know that the potential energy down here is zero. And the kinetic energy down here is maxed as it's approaching the, as it's approaching the, the, uh, the ground, right? So we're transferring this amount from uh, kinetic energy, sorry, potential energy to kinetic energy which means that the total transferred energy is going to be 220,500 uh, joules, roughly, right? If we know this, if we know this, that means that is going to be related to speed, right? Because we know that um, kinetic energy, K, is equal to one-half mv squared, right? One-half m90 times v squared, right? We know that this is the case. Right, so total kinetic energy. If this is a frictionless surface, which is not, right, we would know that 
this would be the case. So we can actually take the, uh, you know, 220,500 joules and say that 220,500 joules would be 0 0.5 times 90 V squared. And we can say, we can solve for, for the total speed by taking the square root of the total, right? But we're getting some reduction in energy because of uh, the 60 newtons of force, right? The 60, newt of, uh, 60 newtons of the force of friction across this, uh, you know, this, uh, the motion, if you will, right? So what is this? It's the sum of all forces across the axis, this axis that, that's right here, right? The total displacement is uh, what it's going to end up being, right? I'm going to displace something by uh, 500 meters. 500 meters, right, as an example, right, is um, the amount of displacement, right? So I know I'm getting, I'm getting work done. These are all the things that you can use to solve this problem. But you see how it's relational. I can calculate how much uh, energy I'm going to use, right? Now, assuming that this is a frictionless surface, let's go back to the Simon 2 question that we had before, right? Imagine that I was using the same system. And again, the system that I'm using here to calculate this is if we go back, way back over here to work and energy, right? We had a work energy theorem. Remember this? The work energy theorem, where we said that the potential energy and uh, it's gravitational and all this kind of stuff. And we came back to this right here, where my change in kinetic energy is kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial, right? Well, kinetic energy final is going to be maxed, right? I'm transferring all my energy from potential energy to kinetic energy, right? That's what I'm doing. So whatever potential energy I had, if it was a frictionless surface, it's now going to be equal to kinetic energy. If I know kinetic energy, then I can calculate velocity, right, or speed. If I can calculate velocity over time, right, um, you know that that's something that I can I can I have velocity over distance as an example. I have a lot of information that I can use to relate to the stuff that I'm that the question is asking for inside of your assignment two, right? So take a look at your assignment two for a second, and that's what I'm saying. Some questions are. Uh, difficult to figure out with um, uh, with by using you know kind of uh, Newton's laws and easier to figure out by using um, energy. Can we use energy? Yes, you can. You can use energy to check at the very least. Uh, the very least, Patrick. So think about this, right? So a metal crate at the top of a friction a frictionless ramp. If the mass of the loot crate is twelve point eight kilograms and it has a rise of three meters and a run of four meters. Three, four, five triangle, right? So we can look at the uh, triangle that we're making. Let's do this. So if I was going to draw this, so here is, let's say the what I'm what I'm getting. So this is something like this, right? So a rise. Let's label it, right? I have a rise of three meters, a rise over run. Right, so let's do this really quickly, and then I'll stop for the day, guys. And I know we're going a little longer today than normal. Let's put in three meters here, and this is four meters. We have a magic triangle, all right? We have a magic triangle that we can use, right? Because we can say that this, the hypotenuse, then would be five meters, right? Guys, I'm giving you this because you guys should be able to figure this out, and no problem at all, right? Three, four, five triangle, magic triangle, right? So we know the distance that it's traveling, five meters total for this particular situation, right? We know the height is three meters, right? Three meters. We also know that um, UG, right, is equal to uh, MGH, right? We know that, where M is the mass of the object, which is 12.8 kilograms, multiplied by gravity, 9.8 meters per second times height, which is something like um, three meters, right? So we have uh, an answer to this. Let's pull up our calculator for a second. Now, how is this going to help you? First of all, you should ask yourself this question too. How does it help you to know all these things? Well, let's see. So if we take this information, this is a frictionless surface for the first part of your, of your assignment too. And if I bring up a calculator and I say something like, if I say something like, uh, 
multiplied by 9.8 multiplied by 3, right, is what? Right, so again, mass times gravity times height, right? All in the right thing. So 376 something, right? Let's try it again. Make sure it's correct. 12.8, right, times 9.8 times times, God, that didn't work out. Where's my AC? 12.8 times 9.8 times 3. 376 joules. Okay, so now that's UG. But we know potential energy transfers to kinetic energy. So potential energy here, up here, is high, right? We know that that's the case. So here uh, we can say that potential energy is maxed. Right, so UG max, right? And at the bottom, we can say that UG is min or zero, right? Because we know that whatever it's going to be when we lift it up, that's the potential energy. We're raising an item above the ground, some some uh, X number of meters. We can say that's UG is zero. But we can also say that up here, right? We can say that um, kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy is zero at this point, at the top. We know that this is true. Kinetic energy starts at zero, right? But at the bottom, we can say that kinetic energy, right, is maxed, right? Because we're transferring kinetic, uh, sorry, uh, potential energy to kinetic energy, right? That's what's happening where there's an energy transfer. That means that at the bottom, if we continue this equation, we can say that kinetic energy is equal to, uh, whatever the potential energy was, which is that number in joules, right? That number in joules, which was, what do we say again? 376.32 joules, right? Again, I'm working this out with you just as, a, as the first part of the equation, right? To see what this is. Then we'll stop for the day, I promise. So 376.2. Right, but that is also equal to one half mv squared. We know that. So mass, so one half times mass, right, which is equal to our um, uh, our twelve point eight kilograms times v squared. Guys, I can find velocity. I can find v. I can find uh, thing. Right. So did I write down something wrong? 376.32. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. 32. So we can see that this is the truth, right? So we know that 376.32 joules is equal to this equation. Well, now I can figure out what the velocity is at the bottom, right? Why? Because I can solve for V. Once I solve for V, then I've solved some part of the equation, right? Why? I have velocity. I have time. I have distance, right? I have velocity and distance. Once I have velocity and distance, right, I have, or displacement, I have other information that I can use. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but try it out. Try calculating this information. It, do you get the same amounts that I do or the same numbers? Uh, it says compute the net force and acceleration. Okay, what's the net force? Force is equal to ma, right? Mass times acceleration. So I need, in order for me to get that, I need acceleration. That's what I need at the bottom. Okay, so how do I get, what equation do I use to get the acceleration at the bottom? I know velocity, I can get speed, no problem. Um, and then it, consider the loop crate as it leaves the ramp, moves into a flat surface. Now that it has some kinetic friction, compute the free body of gravity, and the, the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.42. Calculate the new net force and acceleration. Well, we know we have a speed coming down here. We have a speed and it's accelerating. We go from zero can I calculate the acceleration, the average acceleration, if I go from zero to whatever that number is that I'm gonna get when I calculate speed? I've, I can calculate acceleration that way, no? I have the distance, I have the velocity, I can calculate something, right? And I'm not gonna give you everything, but this is a great way of figuring this stuff out, okay? Where we don't have to use the same equations that we used before. Okay, hopefully that helps.
at least at the very minimum, like I said, you can use it to check your equations so that you come up with the same numbers. All right, back to this. So that is um, uh, the way we would do it. Last example, and then we're going to go be gone for the day. A small car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms travels at 30 meters per second, has its speed reduced to 10 meters by a constant braking force over a distance of 75 meters. Find the car's initial kinetic energy. So small car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms traveling at 30 meters per second. We can say that the initial kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Right? It reduced to 10 meters per second by a constant braking force. 10 meters per second. The car's final kinetic energy is 10 meters per second, so 1 half mv squared. These are in joules. What's the net work done on or, uh, you know, or change in kinetic energy? K final minus K initial, right? That's the net work, right? Find the braking force. Well, we know what the work is, right? And work is equal to what? Force across the displacement times the angle. Remember this? Work, if I take this example again, that, that thing that I showed you earlier, and if I draw that thing, what's the final work? Work is equal to force times displacement times the angle. Once I have work and I can convert, I can take work and energy, right? Force times displacement, right? I can find out the force, and if I find out the force, and I have the I have the mass, I can find the acceleration. That's the way to do this thing. And it can be done much easier because I have the work. If you think about work itself, force times you know uh, times displacement, doesn't say anything about mass, times cos of the angle, whatever the angle is, right? So in a three, four, five diagram, right? Again, let me just draw this one more time for you guys to help out, right? In a three, four, five diagram, again, you have these this diagram that we can draw, right? Here's three, four, five, right? What is this angle? Can anyone tell me what the angle is? Three, four, five diagram? Anybody? 45 degrees, very good. So three, four, five diagram, if we know that the that the angle is 45 degrees and we know that the um work is equal to works also in joules remember works in joules we already have the work in joules we have the kinetic energy right and so because everything is in joules kinetic energy is in joules and we have this is in joules right work is in joules kinetic energy is in joules and now we can start figuring things out we can start uh, saying that the total work, we know what the total work is. The total work is what we figured out with the kinetic energy, the, the sorry, the potential energy to kinetic energy transfer, right? That total work, that was, that was the total of the work that was done, right? Is that not true? I don't, I didn't keep it. So now that we have that total work, we know that work is equal to force times distance. Distance is five meters. We know that, right? We know that force is equal to uh, work is equal to force times distance times cos of the angle. What's cos of 45, guys? Come on, do I have to figure this out for you? Course of 45, what is it? One, right? So that means that it's force times displacement. Displacement is five meters, right? And we know that Force is equal to whatever the, um, uh, what should we call it? The work is equal to force times displacement. We can say that uh, the force then is whatever the total joules was. Right, let's, let's, re let's rewrite the equation here for you guys. To, again, to give you some hints on how to do it, right? We can say that force is equal to the total work, right? Divided by the displacement, right? Can we not say this? Someone is at the front door. Someone's at the front door, right? <laughs> so if we know this is the case, right? Because force work is equal to force times S, S times cos theta. Theta is one. 
we can say that that force then is work divided by displacement and whatever that work number was in joules divided by displacement is work. And we also know that that's equal to mass times acceleration. We know that that's true. So once we figure out the force and we already know the mass is 12.8 kilograms, we can find the acceleration. That's the way we can get it. And it's a way easier way of doing it than other ways, especially when you don't have all the information. Hopefully that helps. At least check it with this kind of equation. Again, we can si just simply, you know, kind of sub in what we know, right? We don't know acceleration, but we do know kilograms. We do know, we do know what the displacement is, right? And let's suppose it was somehow 300 and something joules, right? 300 and X joules or whatever it is, divided by five is equal to this. Right, so we can say that uh, acceleration then is this number divided by 12.8, and that's your total acceleration at the bottom. Okay, which is one thing that this thing is asking. It's telling you that the acceleration, what is the acceleration as it moves down the ramp? Eight, this one, right? And then now that we know what the acceleration is down here, we know that that's the acceleration that's being transferred onto the flat surface. And so there's two parts to the problem. Part one, is this part, like we said before. So let me just do that again, but just let's change the... So we have the, the two parts of the problem, right? And sorry, let's move with uh, green. So the first part of the problem is this part. And the second part of the problem is this part, all right? Where it goes from here and now it transfers from this part of the, the environment, right? to this part of the environment here, where you're now getting into the flat surface, which is um, that has some kind of friction on it, right? Some kind of friction, sur frictional surface right here. And I'm giving you the information, right? But we know what the acceleration is at the bottom because we can figure out with this. So check it. Check to see if your equations work out with the energy of the system, which is another way of getting the same kind of data. All right, any questions around this stuff? So I know there's a lot. I'm sure there is a lot. But um, that's what I was trying to figure out here with you guys right now, where we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? We know that F is equal to MA, right? So, and we can figure out then what the total distance is. And by the way, notice that... Um, We've broken down another formula here where, where we've simplified. We said that uh, it's mass times acceleration times uh, the distance, 500 meters, right? And that's equal to 22,000, uh, 220,500 joules. Then what would be the acceleration? We can figure out the acceleration is 4.9, right? And we also know the negative acceleration uh, is negative 6.667, right? Uh, so we can figure out the result in acceleration. Okay. And there you have it. Okay, so any questions around anything from today? I know there's a lot to take in here, and it's hard to, to see it unless you do it, right? So some of the questions that I gave you are, are something that you might see uh, kind of again and again. Um, let's do a couple more things. So let's look at uh, the schedule before we go. So again, this is a recap. We covered a lot of the stuff, um, you know, Please take a look at uh, it's open book your your test for next week it's open book and you know Miguel says I have to do all the exercises of each week presentation or redo you could or you could create templates answer templates or question templates because I'm telling you that a lot of the stuff I've given you is going to be you're going to see the exact example on the exam with different numbers. Right, so try and figure out some templates where you can plug in some numbers and have the result. You, the common questions that you're going to see, they're going to pop up on the on the test. Okay, so uh, yeah, go through each of the questions that I've given you and try and come up with these things again, or try and look at some additional questions. Change those numbers and see if you get what the numbers mean and do they make sense? Right, so that's what I recommend. And then next week again, early on in the week, again Monday time frame. Until the end of the week, you're going to have a chance to do your midterm test. I'll be here on Thursday during a regular time to help you out with it if there's any kind of questions around it. Okay?
Any questions before we go? Again, remember that assignment two is is uh, move to Sunday for this week. I'll try and make an announcement, but no one's going to pay, pay attention to it because it doesn't send an email anymore. All right. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Enjoy. And uh, we'll see you next week. Good luck on your assignment and on your midterm test. Take care. Thank you. I'll stop recording now.